Now you're live. Now, three fingers swipe up. Quickly. Now click on your Zoom meeting. Now go to the top left and click on the green dot to make it full screen. Okay. No, nope. I said the green dot. Oh, there was a green check. Okay. Full screen. Now you're live and that's all they see. You're good. Wait, but I'm going to check and see if we are live. Okay. All right. It'll be best for Tracy or somebody else to check. Chase, Tracy, can you check to see if we're live on your phone? Uh, yeah, well, I'm actually on my laptop. I'm going to go to your site and see. Is there a way? So it's best for somebody else to check so you don't touch nothing else and mess up your screen. Okay, so, I see. I see that we may. It's not up yet. She said it's, it's not, not up. on. Are you looking at my Facebook? Your Facebook page, yeah. Yeah, I'm on my Facebook. Oh, I see. We're there. I see us. Really? Yeah, it's a delay. Okay, so yeah, you're live. Right? So you see where you're live on your Facebook? Yeah, I see you, Tracy. You look cute, but it's a, it's like a delay. No, it's going to be a delay. Um, but, um, okay, I don't know. Cool. You're live, so you guys still do your thing. Go ahead. Okay. Call me back. All right, we will. All right. Okay, thanks, Kyle. Bye -bye. All right, bye. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Uh, hey, this, everybody. <laughs> yes, this is attorney Robin McCoy and attorney Tracy Martin. And this is where we're here for our political coffee show. Uh, as you saw at the beginning of the show, uh, we were doing the setup. Shout out to our techie person, cameraman, uh, designer, Kyle Caldwell, for helping us to, to, to navigate the technology. Uh, so, um, I, Tracy, I don't know if you got your mug yet. I got my Wonder Woman mug. <laughs> what do you have? Do you have something? Oh, that's my favorite, Robin. I tell you what, in light of uh, everything that's going on in the country, and I'm done with cord today, so I'm treating myself to a martini. I need a drink, man. Okay. <laughs> you know, do what you got to do. <laughs> <laughs> Court. It's you know, what is it? Two fourteen. It's after eleven a.m. So I hey, mean, well, hey, in Europe, you know, they they look like, siesta time. Okay, siesta, baby. So, so you had court. Where did you have court? Well, I had Zoom court uh, in Third Circuit uh, this morning, and uh, in front of Judge Kavanaugh, and um, you know, all the lawyers showed up, but uh, none of the parents did, and um, I don't know if they have access us to the technology but it was something that you know of course we always want the parties to participate in a zoom video conference hearing but um they didn't and it was something that we could get done without them so we did we proceeded without them and you know that was my court appearance for this morning so in the meantime i've been negotiating the settlement of a few cases and I have a four o'clock um, talk with an attorney about a case, and but um, you know, speaking of cases, this uh, this news about Keith Ellison being appointed the a special independent uh, prosecutor on the People versus Derek Chauvin, the alleged killer cop in the George Floyd incident, is really huge news. Everybody's buzzing and talking about it, and I see on your Facebook page you got. Uh, uh, he is the attorney general of the state of Minnesota. I see you've got his photo, his image on your banner. There yes. Well, you know, I know him from, you know, just my activity with the Democratic Party and, you know, my aunt, you know, I, I um, you know, I've known him because, you know, my aunt, Aunt Virgie, shout out to Aunt Virgie. Um, also, Aunt Queenie, I got a lot of aunts, but anyway, um, but um so I met him, I've just met him over the years. And I remember when he ran for um, chair of the Democratic Party, um, I know they chose, they right. decided to go with Tom Perez and uh, he ran for attorney general. And then I know there is a lot of buzz about him, uh, you know, going for governor of Minnesota and maybe running for president someday. So who knows? Interesting. You know, <laughs> that's interesting, but yeah, you know, Keith Ellison's uh, Detroit connections are very interesting. He was born right here in Detroit, Michigan. We're based in Detroit, Michigan, and he was the first Muslim 
uh, to be sworn into U.S. Con Congress. So I followed his career. It's very interesting to me. But uh, what is of, of major interest right now is I saw Keith Ellison, I think it was on MSNBC or CNN earlier today. And, um, you know, he is cautioning everyone about a rush to ju justice. And, you know, he says that he's going to take his time prosecuting this case because he doesn't want any major mess ups or anything happening. Uh, and he says, quote, I need to protect this prosecution. Minnesota AG Keith Ellison will lead the George Floyd case. So he's being very careful, I noticed, to, you know, make sure all the T's are crossed and all the I's are dotted. It's going to be a fascinating case, and I wonder if they're going to change the venue, if that's going to make any difference at all. Yes. I mean, I think it is important. Like, I got a call this morning about a potential police misconduct case here in, um, it was a person that was at the protest on Saturday, and, uh, you know. In Ypsilanti? No, not the one. In, it was in Detroit. Was that in Ypsilanti? No, 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 no. It was oh, it was Detroit. in Detroit, and it was it was a young man said that he had had some a situation with the police, and um, you know I had said um, to him he said he was taken to the hospital, and I said, well, do you have any injuries? I mean, so because it's like, uh, and I also reached out to uh, a colleague of mine, Attorney Arnold Reed. Shout out to Attorney Arnold Reed. He has said that uh, he would come on our show and talk with us about uh, police misconduct cases. Oh, great. Yes, because he said that he's he's been doing them for a number of years. He's taken them to trial. And he was talking about kind of like, you know, I've talked to him about this, this referral, about this potential case for this morning, and then about some of the other cases that are out there. Um, and so it's, they, it, you, when, you know, as you know, as a lawyer, uh, you don't just jump on any old case. You got to look at, uh, look at the case and evaluate whether it's a viable case and and then or whether you're it's a case you should take or refer to somebody else and um because you and i you know you and i both do family law but we have to screen our cases we can't we're not just jumping on any okay it doesn't matter whether it's criminal family law you want to make sure you have a client that is going to follow your lead and and not just be all out there all over the place um, you know, when you do indigent defense, it's, it's a little bit harder. I do indigent defense. So sometimes you have clients that will, will go rogue on you and you have to really learn how to, um, you know, navigate, use your skills to, to, to rein them in. I mean, well, you, you work over there, you do some at the juvenile court with parents, you know, on neglect cases. So I know you, you've had your experiences too, as well. Right. I represent uh, parents, but I also represent uh, juveniles. And so I'm very much part of the entire juvenile justice system. In fact, I, thanks to you, I, I just joined the National Bar Association. You and Linda McGee uh, inspired me to finally join the NBA, not the basketball league, of course. Yes, the National <laughs> Bar Association. And uh, so I don't have my membership number yet, but, you know, one thing that really drove me to just finally take the plunge, because it is a rather expensive membership, and um, it was, but what inspired me is this, um, the MBA Police Misconduct and Justice Task Force, that's what I'm holding up, and, um, you know, that's of major interest to me. I before I became a family law attorney, I did, um, well, right out of the gate, um, out of law school, I worked for a medium-sized firm, uh, what most would characterize as a black law firm, and we um, handled municipal liability and medical malpractice and auto negligence, and so I ended up uh, representing actually a major city on um, a number of police brutality cases, and uh, I, at one time represented RoboCop, if you can believe that. And, okay. um, you know, those cases ended up settling because, I mean, it was indefensible. You know, you sat in a deposition and you listened to the facts. And I think that's one thing that people don't realize uh, what it takes to work up a case and the expense involved. And uh, many lawyers need to obtain financing, actually, to work a case up properly, you know, because you need the medical records and you need to take a number of depositions and you need to hire expert witnesses. Now, what I find really interesting and important with this George Floyd case is uh, your friend and colleague, 
Benjamin Crump was on national TV saying that the autopsy results came back as um, asphyxiation and not being a cause of death. And so attorney Crump has um, hired Dr. Michael Bodden to conduct an independent autopsy. And I'm going to find that we're all going to find that to be very interesting to see what those results are. And he says, frankly, he didn't trust the medical examiner's um, conclusion with respect to that official autopsy of the remains of George Floyd. Yes, I think that's why, uh, like I said, when it comes to looking at cases, uh, you want to evaluate, you want to, I think it's important that the public knows that you talk to the lawyer right away. You have some people that want to run and hurry up and get in front of the cameras and say certain things. And But you need to talk to a lawyer because a lawyer can help you develop the case from beginning to the end. And if you rush out there and you you get too hyped up, talk, you know, you talk to the media about certain things, uh, you know, one, if you're injured and you're rushing out there, then people are going to be like, how are you going to be rushing out there? How are you rushing in front of the cameras and you're injured? I mean, if you're really injured, you should be going to the hospital. Like I got a call the other day about a potential case of auto accident. And I said, go to the hospital. That's what we tell people in our firm. You know, my father and I have a firm. Uh, we're based in our, our, our physical office is in Ann Arbor, but we also, you know, you know, I'm in Detroit. I'm in Detroit. I'm in all over Michigan, wherever there is a viable case, you know, we'll go. Uh, but but it's but you got to make sure it's a viable case. And um, so and you got to as a client, you, when we give you as attorneys, when we give you a list of things to do. You got to follow it up, follow up, make sure if you've been injured, you got to go to the hospital right away. Get the police report, get, you know, um, don't rush to talk to the media. Don't rush to talk to the police because they, you know, talk to a lawyer to make sure that you're not uh, giving your rights away. That's part of why I do my workshops on what to do and stop by the police. And uh, because I want to make sure that people- oh, That's are great. Are you going to be doing another one? Are you going to be doing a virtual version? Um, yeah, I do to plan to do- that's okay. Well, that's what a lot of people have been asking me. I did one on my YouTube page, uh, Robin Legal, Robin with a Y. And uh, I did a, it was probably about a 20 minute one, but yeah, I have had a lot of calls, especially since this George Floyd, Floyd case, people have been asking me about like, Robin, we know you've been doing these videos for a number of years. What are your thoughts about what happened with George Floyd? And, you know, you know, like, and like first starting with the, the way that they had the photography, is it permissible to um, videotape and you know you can videotape uh, what's going on with the police but typically you can't go in and interfere with what they're doing because you could it could be considered obstruction of justice but with this George Floyd case that was like watching a lynching and so there are situations where you can go in and defend another hard to watch huh I didn't hear what you said uh, well I was saying it's just it was just so hard to watch. Yeah, there's a delay and there's some interference on the Zoom call. But, you know, some people on social media were criticizing the photographer of that incident where Derek Chauvin put his knee on the neck of George Floyd for eight minutes and 46 seconds. Well, that video was taken by a 17-year-old by the name of Darnella. And had it not been for her, we would have been none the wiser. You know, the police would have just chalked it up as, oh, you know, George Floyd, he was resisting arrest. He's a big guy. And we did what we have to do, you know. But we see the video evidence now. And um, I do believe that the protests that ensued as a result of this heinous incident is really what caused uh, the arrest of Chauvin because, you know, they weren't acting fast enough. This uh, Hennepin County um, prosecutor or county attorney. Uh, so I'm glad that Keith Ellison is now on the case. But, you know, some people are saying, hey, you know, you got to watch him too. You know, nothing against Keith Ellison, but uh, there are pressures, you know, because this is a high profile case. And I have full faith and confidence that Keith Ellison will prosecute the case uh, appropriately. If not, then, you know, we'll, he'll be hearing from a lot of people. Um, but that's great to hear that Arnold Reeve may join us on Political Coffee and uh, one day soon. And I hope that we also get attorney Benjamin Crump 
to come on. Because yeah, I have, talk to him I have talked time. to him. Yeah, he has said, just go ahead and set it up. And so I will, I plan to reach out to him. I know, you know, he's like, it's busy. He's very busy. He's right. got, I'm like, I'm like, Ben, I'm seeing he's on TV every day. He's got, it's crazy because you had the Ahmad Armory case out of, you know, you know Arbery case out of um, in Georgia. Brother can't even right. jog. You can't even jog anymore. You, it's like we got to have our own compound or something or go to Africa to jog. We can't even jog in America without being harassed. And and then they try to, you know, it's like in the beginning, it's always interesting the way the media kind of does some, some of it. Like in the beginning, oh, this black man, he's been attacked. And, he, and then they try to stir some stuff up about him being in the house. And it's like, okay, but that doesn't mean that he should be lynched, you know? And uh, my parents, they were talking about their house that when their house was being built, that there were people that walked around their house, but that was not, no, you know, they never, that was never, they never raised a big issue about that when their house was being built. So um, basically with Ahmad Armory, that, that was just like another situation where it's a lynching. It's like, you know, it's so, it's so surreal um, you know, growing up, you know, we read about these these lynchings of black people and the traditional lynching is a lynching where, you know, you're seeing black people hanging from a tree and, you know, you see some of those crazy images of some people having white people, some of them having barbecues and sitting there smiling Picnics. and making postcards right. out of it. And and then you read about it. And you're like, man, that was a messed up stuff. And but then now we're living in an era where it's like then that's what Ben Crump talks about in his book. The, the, you know, open season, the legalized genocide of color people, which is a must read. Everybody need to read, especially if you black in America, you need to read yeah. this book. I ordered mine. Okay. I ordered mine. Okay. I just, cause you know, Amazon. I teach a class at EMU and this was part of our assigned reading. I was, he's got, it's like 12 chapters in here. I told Ben, I said, this book, I'm like, we need to have this book. You have the middle school students reading this, the high school students reading this college students, law students, everybody, every black man, every black woman, every black child need to read this book. So, but anyway, in the book, what he does is he talks about how um, the police misconduct situations is the slow genocide of, of black people. Um, also like the Trayvon Martin and the Zimmerman situation, you know, he wasn't a cop, he was a wannabe cop. So it's like, that's what, with the case in, in, you know, the Ahmad Arbery case, it's like that you have the McMichaels, the, the two, the father and son and the neighbor, like they, they're want to be cop or, you know, and it's basically like a lynching there. Then you see what happened with, um, George Floyd, the lynching, he gets lynched. And, you know, you always, the, 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 you know, I'm hearing, you hear music and they talk about how the white man's always got his foot on my neck. And this, in this situation, the white man literally had his foot on George's, George literally. Floyd's neck. And then Brianna and Taylor. And he had his hand in his pocket while he was doing it. Right. right. Then you got well, you Brianna know. Taylor. Oh, I can't. I, I'm sorry. Well, what I there's a double standard uh, at work in America. We're both lawyers, and I won't speak for you, but I know that I have seen in court a difference in how justice is meted out based on the defendant or the respondent who is standing in court. And that is not fair. You mentioned Ahmaud Arbery. Well, there was a double standard uh, in that many uh, people have walked through that construction site with that home being built. And uh, the owner said that he never had any issues with uh, Mr. Arbery walking through. He was jogging. Ahmad Arbery was jogging. And, you know, I, I understand that he was looking for water, like a water source. I, I guess he you know, he was jogging and he needed to, you know, get some water. He was thirsty. And, um, you know, we all know what happened. Uh, these uh, McMichaels came out. And then what I find interesting about this case, though, is that the individual who took the video in that case is now also being charged. And uh, basically as an aider and a better. And uh, that's is really interesting to see how that is going to all, you know, shake out. And then with George Floyd, what I find so remarkably double standardish is the fact that, and I, I spoke about this a little bit earlier in time. Okay, so George Floyd was alleged to have passed up 
counterfeit $20 bill. Now, he may not have even known it was counterfeit. I have known people who have received, you know, counterfeit bills in stores. I even had one at one point in time. I didn't know it was counterfeit. And right. for this, he loses his life. And in contrast, this Derek Chauvin is married to an Asian woman who's now filed for divorce, by the way. Her name is Kelly Chauvin. And she incidentally is also an attorney. And um, I read a, from a, a reliable source that Kelly Chauvin at one point in time in her life had an issue with a, writing a hot check. If there's no allegation about it, she wrote a hot check and she was allowed to, it was for $42 and she was allowed to pay that amount off with uh, I think uh, some additional costs and the case was dismissed, it went away. But right. in contrast, Derek Chauvin chokes the absolute life out of George Floyd by kneeing him on his neck, you know, for eight minutes and 46 seconds. The gentleman's crying out for mercy, crying out for his mother. He urinates on himself, and Darnella Floyd is capturing it all on camera. She's 17 years old. She couldn't intervene because then she would have been arrested. Um, but I just thank God that the, you know, child took the video and now I know. we've got these national protests. I right. Mean, and they say the children the, shall the lead. And with the George Floyd case, too, they said that the store owner, he he didn't he didn't never wanted it to be like that. He never expected that it would be that way, uh -huh. the way that, you know, so it's we're we're definitely in some interesting times. And um, it's it's you know, it's crazy when you think that we're in America. And you read about lynching of, of black people hanging from a tree. And now in America, you have black people being killed by the police. That's the, the new way of the of the lynching. And when I say this, I'm not saying that every police officer is a bad person. I have a friends, I have colleagues, you know, I do these workshops on what to do when stopped by the police. And sometimes I'll do them by myself, or I bring in police officers, judges, prosecutors. And uh, but but there are some bad. Obviously, there are some bad some bad apples out there. In every profession, there are bad apples. And but when but the the difference with the police is they are they have a badge, they have a weapon, they're being put in this role of um, almost like judge, jury, and juror and executioner. Right. And 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 that's and and in America, it just when you're seeing all this happening. And, and 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 startling rates and then it's not like it hasn't been happening all along it's just that now we have video footage like scripture says what's done in the dark will come to light so now you have right. this camera that you can use to, to to show the world what how america really is how it treats its black people and right and and so uh it's it and it's just i don't even understand many you know minnesota they're like all like, why can't you just stop protesting and rioting? Well, why can't people see justice? I mean, the officers that were involved with killing George Floyd, all of them need to be arrested. They need to be charged. It don't even need to me. Don't even try to have it as a jury because you're going to drag it out. People going to be mad. You still going to risk that they're going to come. They're going to some stuff is going to jump off. He, they, it needs, he need, they need to be arrested, charged. They need to plead guilty uh and 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 serve their time and then and then everybody can just go back you know the protesters everybody can slow it down and and go on to brianna taylor move on to louisville you know i'm I've, i'm sure you've been following there there in louisville kentucky take the fight to yes. to for brianna taylor because i mean she's a first responder and the police they go in the wrong house and then her boyfriend is there to defend her and then they they um you know, it's just crazy. He's there to defend her and then he gets charged and then we got to try to get him out of uh, being uh, locked up and charged. And 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 so what you just see is because I've been doing this 18 years, I've been doing it as criminal defense attorney, family law, neglect, delinquency, all of that is that it's just systematic and it's just the way black people, we're just vilified in America. It's like you know, you read about those folks that have said we maybe we should go back to Africa, go, go, go. I don't know about Africa, though, because I mean, I love Africa. I've been Not I've lived in Africa. Therapy. But what yeah. I'm saying is Africa has been affected by white supremacy as well. And it's like the question is, is there any place that is safe for yeah. us as black people in this world? We it, it, it shouldn't be like this. We're we're the original people, you know, and we should 
we should be able to have the freedom. Uh, and it's and it's time for our our white brothers and, and white Hispanic Native Americans. It's time for the rest of the world to wake up. And, and rescue us. I mean, because I, you know, I talk about this. I just did a video on how to protest peacefully, stay your ass at home. <laughs> and I know you did a video. I just shared your video on voting, taught, educating people about voting. And I'm just like, this is just crazy. I mean, it's like black people, we need, we should be taking the time to heal. We got this coronavirus. We should be taking the time to heal. But then we, we got this, this cap savior kind of, complex and it's, it's a complex because it's it's conditioning we've been conditioned to be the saviors of ourselves and other people but then you they we get out there we risk getting the covid virus and it's like we shouldn't even have to go out in the first place the the people who are in power need to fix this the children are watching and and, and just it's just it's like a it's a it's not a good look for America right now. I'm rooting for America. You see, I got my American flags. I love America. You know, yeah, um, God bless America. Okay, but America need to wake up and get it together. Because otherwise, I mean, well, America needs to do better. America needs to do better. And uh, the unfortunate um, consequence of, of all of this, I mean, is that well, it's actually not an unfortunate consequence, but I think what is coming out of this horrific incident is that there's now a dialogue that has been opened about uh, police reform and criminal justice reform. And there's going to be a demand on leadership, you know, for uh, leaders to come out from behind their offices and their podiums and to actually listen to their constituents in, the, in their community and to propose legislation uh, to effectuate prison reform. Um, so, you know, this is an election year. Uh, we have a, a primary that is um, just, what, 63 days away here in Michigan and 154 days away for the general election and people need to flex their political muscles and get to the polls um, and to participate in the process, whether it's by absentee ballot or to actually go in person because um, there's just too much at stake. And we do need police reform now. This police misconduct cannot stand. And one thing that I do like to see is that, this, that we are seeing unity it's not only black and brown people that are out here protesting, but you see white people and you see Latinos and you see Asian people and you see Arabic people and you see Indian people and everybody is coming together because America is sick and tired of this open season on black and brown people and other minority people and it's got to stop. It has got to stop. Enough is enough. And what I find remarkable is that people are not um, you know, put aback by the COVID-19 pandemic. They're out there. Some of them are wearing masks. Some of them are not. And they're standing shoulder to shoulder with people. They're not doing social distancing because they have such a conviction about the need for change, the need for police reform now that they're risking it all. That's how I see it. And God bless them. God bless them. God bless them. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I think um, I know I've watched some of the footage I know, and that's what people have said. They're said, look, you know, I'm, I'm fed up. They like, okay, I can get COVID, but also I could be uh, brutalized by the, the police. And again, disclaimer, it's not all police. We know, I know I can, I have I, my friends out there that are police and be like, Robin, it's not all of us. Okay. It's not all of you, but just like, as the children have said to me, when I do the programs on what to do and stop by the police, the children have said to me, Miss McCoy, we appreciate and love you for doing these programs, but are you talking to the police and telling the police to stop killing us? Because if the police would stop killing black people in America, then we wouldn't, I wouldn't have to do a program on what to do when stopped by the police. I wouldn't have had, I, you know, I was compelled to do the programming because of what happened. Well, you know, what I've seen, I, you saw Trayvon Martin with with Zimmerman, who was not a official police, but he's a wannabe police officer. And it, to me, it's, it's just still a travesty. What is it, eight years? It's a travesty that 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 there was no justice in that situation with Trayvon Martin. And it's, you know, it's like Trayvon Martin, Michael Brown, Tamir Rice. Uh, America is just looking real. Eric it's, Garner. Yeah, Eric Sandra Garner. Lance, I mean, and you're seeing Orlando mirrors. Castillo, yeah. Jamar you, Clark. 
Right. There's just, there's so much, you know, or I mean, Rosser was a, bl a black woman in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Her boyfriend calls the police because she's having a mental breakdown and they shot her in the head and killed her. And the prosecutor deemed it justifiable homicide. And, you know, I'm like, is there no place? It just doesn't seem like there's any place that's safe in America for, for a black person. And it shouldn't be that way. We were brought here uh, as slaves, we built this country. We are we are some of the most loyal people to America. You know, we fought in every war from the from you know the revolution, American Revolution, to the Civil War, to World War One, Two, Korean War, Vietnam, all of that. Um, Iraq. You know, my mom is a veteran and and a nurse, and we we always and that's you know that you and I. This is political coffee, and we've talked about this. There's been a big issue as far as black folk, like um, that we're always loyal, even when people step on us, you know, there's been concerns about us as far as the Democratic Party. You know, I am a card Karen Dim, you know, I have in my family, we have Dems, we have uh, Republicans, but I'm a card Karen Dim. Uh, but, but there have been concerns about how we constantly, we're always giving and but we're, we're we're not we're not you know what did what did uh, Martin Luther King say? It's like for black folks in America always gives us a, a, a check mark insufficient funds, and um, you know there's that you and I have talked about this too about with with uh -huh. Joe Biden, you know who's his VP choice going to be? You know who is it going to be? And is it you know is it and even some of you know we what did you think? Did you watch the interview that he had with Charlemagne the God? Yeah, I mean, you know my feelings on that. I was highly offended by Biden's remarks, but uh, that just seems like a lifetime ago. Um, and now we've seen a lack of leadership coming out of uh, the Oval Office and the actual triggering remarks uh, that have been um, put out there by the POTUS on Twitter that have only served to further divide people instead of unite them. I find that reprehensible. And so, um, you know, I'm all in for Biden. I think that Trump has got to get out of the White House. Uh, he cannot stand. And if you look at the protests that occurred in Lafayette Park last night, where uh, fires were set and, you know, people were pressing on the gates, I think that's indicative of people being fed up with the lack of leadership uh, coming out of Washington, D.C., and um, the Senate and the Congress as well, um, you know, the, things have got to improve. They've got to get better. But I do want to touch on about, you know, where's their safe place for black people? Uh, as you know, um, Africa has, uh, the continent of Africa and the black countries in Africa have had their own set of problems. I mean, look at South Africa and how it was, you know, raided of all of its natural resources and and people resources and apartheid, you know, um, existed until it was done away with and Nelson Mandela became the president. I mean, how can that happen in a, on the continent of Africa? Um, you know, Marcus Garvey was a pro proponent of the Back to Africa movement in the United States and look what happened to him. Um, my grandfather actually represented Marcus Garvey and, uh, you know, they try to get him on anything they could have gotten him on. And um, he ended up dying alone in uh, London. And, um, you know, his movement was, was usurped. It was cut short. So I think that Black people have too much at stake here. Um, we have a stake in this country, and I think that we need to stay here and make things better here. We need to make reform happen here. And now white people are listening, you know, for a long time, there was the silence. I mean, there have always been white allies. I mean, you know, the people that come to mind are, you know, my hero, John Brown, you know, and um, President Abraham Lincoln. I mean, he's my favorite president of all time. Was he perfect? No. But um, the Emancipation Proclamation, yay, baby, you know. So um, I think that people have to get out and vote because our futures, all of our futures are at stake. And and with absentee ballots coming right to your home, I mean, there's just no excuse. 
not to participate in the process. Right. You know no, I, I agree. And what, what you were talking about with apartheid, like when I was in college, I went to University of Michigan and I took a class on constitutionalism in South Africa. And then I actually went and did an externship in South Africa. And um, I remember like wow. when I went there, yeah, there was a, another student before me who had gone there and or who really wanted to go there when, you know, when it came time for Mandela to become president. Um, he wanted to go there and he wanted to create a program there. So they created the program and and I went when and Becky was president. But when I went there to South Africa, they had such a positive vision about their country of what could be, um, even despite all of the uh, atrocities that had occurred with Stephen Biko and what had happened to Nelson right. Mandela being locked up for 27 years. And, you know, um, you know, they had to abolish the jury trial system because it was they just found that it was so racist there. And, and I, you know, as I'm on the plane and I'm arriving in South Africa, I'm just thinking to myself, how is it that you can have uh, a country that's predominantly black with a white minority and where the white people are running everything? And and but then. They what they did is they there was different there's different tribes in South Africa and you know it's like the Willie Lynch effect like the Willie Lynch letter like the slave master talks about d dividing us black people dividing us based on our complexion um our religion our sex and language language, language. There yeah were different languages yeah just and like it, with the uh, indigenous people of America, you know, some people say Indians, some people say first people, first nations, but uh, that was one of the reasons why um, these colonizers were able to come in and divide the Indians because they, and I do have Indian blood, um, Cherokee Nation, um, is because everybody spoke different languages. And so that's a whole nother discussion. But um, I think it's time for change reform now and that's why i think this election is going to be so pivotal and i think people now feel it and uh, that's why you see all these mass protests um but i do want to ask you this question because white people are now listening and you see more allies because you see white people locking arms with black people and they're protesting peacefully and asking, demanding for um, police reform. Now, do you think that this is now the right time for a reparations bill to really be taken up? You know, we had the Honorable John Conyers uh, introduce, was it um, HB 40? Uh, for it's years HR... And years. And then, um, HR 40. Yes, HR 40. Um, to just study it, just study the idea, the concept of reparations. Are we now in a time where reparations could finally be taken up? And when I say reparations, not just monetary reparations, I do believe that that is an order, but also, you know, uh, counseling and treatment and therapy and um, literacy programs. What do you think? I mean, is this a good time? Is the climate right for well, reparations in America? Yeah, it's interesting you should say that because I've been asked to come speak about, um, not physically, but via Zoom uh, at a program about COVID and reparations uh, on oh. Saturday. Um, I'll, you know, I'll post the information. Um, and I also, uh, in, the class, right. the, in the class that I teach at EMU on law and the African-American experience, I uh, we we read the uh, Ta-Nehisi Coates article, the case for reparations, and we read HR 40, and actually had the students do an essay about this. But for me, I feel like it. We are long overdue. My fifth generation grandfather was a slave. I mean, we have we are we're the we're the products of slaves. My my grandparents were sharecroppers. And and when I look at you know to, you know I I I'm I was born in Ann Arbor and I grew up in Ypsilanti, and I went to Catholic school twelve years so I was raised in a predominantly white environment and so I'm I'm very familiar with white people love y'all love y'all I mean, anyway, um not the ones that are killing black people though no 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 y'all you know I don't know I mean I know I'm Christian we're supposed to love everybody but if you killing killing people that's just not cool at all but anyway okay I'm sorry I got. Went on my little tangent. Okay, my point is about reparations. Oh, is when we right. have the conversation with with uh with with white folk about reparations, they say, "Well, slavery, oh, that happened so long ago." Or slavery, you know, none of my people owned slaves, and it's like, okay, 
it happened so long ago, then why? And, you know, and Ben talks about it in the book, too. Why do we still see inequities in our American system when it comes to education, health care, employment, and the police are killing us? If it's if it's uh, right. if slavery is so far gone, then why do we still have black people being oppressed in America? OK, if you can go back, you can look because in the class right. we talk about this. You can go back to slavery and you can look at what happened to us as slaves and then you've got cases you know that go before the supreme court dred scott you got you have you know where he can't he he not even there was he was in a state where he was supposed to be free but the court was like oh no no you can't be free then you got plessy versus ferguson right. separate right. but equal separate. he goes before the supreme court supreme court is like no separate but unequal okay and then you go to brown versus board of education right. one and two and then it's like oh we'll overturn uh, Plessy versus Ferguson, but then you get Milliken versus Bradley, 1974, where you have issues with uh, uh, segregation in, in the Detroit public school system, and they they and Thurgood Marshall. By that time, Thurgood Marshall is a judge on the U.S. Supreme Court. He was a lawyer on Brown versus Board of Education, and right. and and then they have problems, and they're like, oh. You can give it, you know, Thurgood Marshall is saying, no, the federal uh, system needs to come in and, and deal with this. The federal courts needs to monitor this. And because it, the racism, the badge of racism has not been cured. You're still having people who are uh, discriminating against uh, black children. And, and the court said, oh, no, you can leave it for local control. And here we are now, 2020, and look at the state of schools in Detroit, not just Detroit, in Flint. I right. mean, Battle Creek, everywhere you know, you, you, Benton Harbor, everywhere you Benton go, Benton Harbor, Harbor Benton Harbor, yeah. I'm related to like half of the people. Shout out to my people from Benton Harbor. I'm related to like half of them. <laughs> and I mean, and then, and, and I love Governor Whitmer. I love her. But when, when they were talking about shutting down Benton Harbor, I was like, oh no, I was talking to the, some of her people. I was like, no, no, we can't shut down Benton Harbor because that's like half of my relatives. And there's statistics wow. that show when kids, don't go to school. They're more likely to get caught up and get in trouble and have problems. And so it's it's like, and if why you, can't they go to school in their own communities? Why do they have to go, you know, to that other city? What is it, St. Joseph or something? The uh, St. Joseph. And something? then I have, yeah. And I've, I've talked to some people that have gone to some of the schools in the neighboring areas and they said they've experienced racism and discrimination at the St. Joe high school, that there was racism, that the, the N word graffiti, all kinds of stuff. And so it's like, and they just exacerbate the school to prison pipeline because the black kids are, you know, significantly, uh, you know, disciplined at a higher rate than, uh, the white kids, frankly, and, uh, they end up in the juvenile detention facilities with cases and they get records. And I see that all the time in the work that I do. And it's not fair and it's not right at all. At all. And right. so I do think that this is a time of reform in America. I think that Dr. King would be pleased at the unity in terms of the protesters. And I, I, I don't know, I think that now more than ever, the time may be right for reparations to happen. Right, um, and you know, you talk, to, you talk to my mom, Nurse Pam, and I know, shout out to Nurse Pam. I know she's out, she's watching. Um, she like, we don't need no study. We need our money. They need to cut us a check. It's more than just a check. It need to be a check. You should be able to go to, if you a, a African, a black person descendant of slave, you should be able to go to school, get a free ride, ride for school. You shouldn't have to pay taxes. I mean, we should be like, I, I mean, it, it's just, we have had, since we've been here, we have had systematic oppression and it happens on a regular basis. I mean, I don't even, it's, it's like, there, you know, you talk to some people, they're like, oh my gosh, I wouldn't want to be a black person in America because that's one of the most, you, you got to worry about, you can't even jog, you can't even walk in your neighborhood, you can't even drive in your car, you can't even be in your house, where, just tell me this, where in America, there just seems to be no place in America that a black person is safe, and even if you become the president of the United States, you still have to deal with racism, it, it doesn't matter if you become, if you're, right. you know, whatever position you get, in America, as long as you black, you gonna get uh, you gonna get some some uh, ex some experience. You are gonna get that American experience. Whereas if you go to other parts of the world, I've I've been I've lived in other parts of the world. I've visited. I've been to France. I've been to uh, what India, South Africa, Zimbabwe, Senegal. You don't always get that experience. You know, Indian. Shout out to my Indian people. 
when I went to India, they were, most of the people like my color with straight hair, you know, and you know, the Africans traveled over into India and the Indian people are black people with straight hair. Now I know some of them, we got to pray for them. Some of them are confused, just like some of us are confused. Uh, but I mean, I, I love, I'm just saying, I know I'm getting off on a tangent. You asked me about reparations. The thing about reparations, right. they, they, they gave reparations to Jewish people from the, the effects of Holocaust. There were reparations given to the Japanese. Um, my Native American people, they've had some things that have been, been done for them, but you still see they catching, they catching the most hell with this COVID. And then, but black folk, it's like, oh, you know, oh, they don't need reparations. What do they need reparations? Oh, they put drugs in our community to kill us. They put police in our community to kill us. And, oh, but we don't need reparations, but we built this country. We fight for this country. And, and then we still get, get poo pooed on. That's basically what happens. Yes, and I don't understand why it's such a divisive issue. You mentioned the other racial and ethnic groups that have received reparations, and rightfully so. Uh, the Jewish Holocaust, horrific. I mean, reparations were completely um, called for, and Jewish people to this day receive all manner of therapy and counseling and, and opportunities for such um, because it was a horrific incident that impacted six million Jewish people, as I understand it, and we all know the horrors and atrocities that um, went on in the Japanese internment camps, uh, Japanese-American internment camps. You had Americans who were put in those camps, but just because they had Japanese heritage during uh, the World War II era, uh, they were put in those camps, but they did receive reparations. And then, of course, um, you mentioned um, the Sioux Nation, I believe, is who was really experiencing um, a bad time in connection with the COVID-19 pandemic. And, you know, you get these interlopers that, um, oh, you know what, my time is coming to an end. I just got a message. Um, but uh, on, they're trying to protect their, their land, their reservations. And, and, you know, you had a governor that, you know, doesn't want to honor that, even though there is a tribal treaty. But Black people also need reparations, and I don't understand why. Well, I do understand why. It's just out and out discrimination and bias. And um, But uh, now people, I think, are starting to listen, and that's why I think that this is a, a ripe time for reparations. So we shall see. Right, so and I have videos when, about them. You can check out my videos if you go to Robin Legal or my YouTube, Robin oh, Legal. Good. Well, I want to hear your talk, your presentation on reparations. And don't you have an expungement clinic coming up at the end of the week, too? Yeah, we're, we reached out to uh, some of our local officials about doing an expungement workshop. And so basically, we're going to talk about how to set aside your conviction. We're going to talk Good. about the pending legislation that's here in Michigan to expand the expungement statute. We're also going to talk about uh, the federal pardon process, as you and oh, I great. both know, we wrote a letter to the president to request clemency for uh, Kwame Kilpatrick, the former mayor of Detroit. I also, I sent an email to follow up to see what the status was of that, uh, uh, the letter. And I also put in there a request for the release of the, you know, all nonviolent offenders that are caught up in the federal prison system. Fantastic. Yeah. And so we're still waiting to see now it looks, I don't know, it looks like with the Kwame situation that there was a setback, but that's why it's incumbent. It's, this is about teamwork. As you and I both know, it's about teamwork. Um, there's, right. He still could get clemency or federal pardon from the president. So it's incumbent on everybody to reach out to the president and, and request that, that they pardon Kwame, they give him clemency immediately, and all the, the, the brothers that are locked up, brothers, sisters, children who are locked up, who are nonviolent, they need to be freed. They need to be given, the, just like when I work, you know, you and I work with kids. I work with kids in the neglect court. You have, they need to have people that are like foster parents to help them um, come back into society, embrace them, and help them to be um, full citizens, you know, because it's like, and then, you know, you have the innocence project. Like, what about the people? There's people, thousands of people that are locked up that are innocent or, or people that are locked up on some trumped up, like garbage, like drug charges, like that. And it's like, come on. It's like the prisons, I feel like they should be the places for like murderers, people who are accused of murder, rape. Um, but if, if for marijuana, that's, that's another travesty. Yeah, because marijuana is legal here, right. and then you can get locked up. You, you have a disproportionate number of blacks, and you know the crack cocaine and all of that. Uh, it's again, 
it, it shouldn't be a, it shouldn't be no study about reparations for black people it should be like okay how how are we going to give reparations to black people how are we going to do it right. how are we going to heal how america how are we going to have truth and reconciliation in america when it comes to all the atrocities that have been done to us as far as the police uh racist people uh, you know, look at the park, like the brother in the park in Central Park. He can't even walk in the park without um, somebody saying some, somebody coming for him. I mean, it's right. like where Mr. Cooper. Yeah. yeah, I think they were both named Cooper too. the woman, the white woman who called to threaten to call 911. Actually, she did call 911 on him. Her last name was Cooper and his last name was Cooper, too. But um, it's just um, I think we are in some perilous times. But I think there's still hope. And uh, the glimmer of hope that I see is the people who are now listening and they are open to the idea of police reform. And I hope that they are open to the idea of reparations. And we will see what happens with that. So I look forward to hearing more about your expungement workshop and your uh, presentation um, by Zoom. Is it going to be by Zoom? Um, about the reparations the one on issue. reparations i think it'll be zoom and facebook i know they sent me a link i'll share okay. that and then you have a presentation coming up too on uh talking with uh judge gant on voting right rights. That's, like, uh, right that's going to be on saturday june 20th at 12 noon and the honorable kamisha d gant will be joining me and we're going to be talking about voter education and how to register for vote to vote excuse me i've got the um the application here to register to vote. You know, the Michigan Secretary of State's offices are open today. You could do business there now by appointment. You have to stay out in your car until they call you, but they're open for business. And we're going to be talking about voting by mail, the absentee ballots. Now you don't have to have a reason to vote by mail, to vote by absentee in Michigan. Thank God for that. And uh, because I do believe that most people will be voting absentee uh, during this election cycle. And we're going to be talking about, you know, flipping over for the ballot and, you know, voting for judges because people oftentimes forget to vote for judges and, and really judges have so much impact on people. Oh, Tracy, I can't hear you. Oh, it, it's, hello, Tracy, hello, Tracy, hello. I guess I gotta go. Okay. Well, thank. It's good talking with you. And um, stay tuned, everyone. We'll be we'll be back um, probably maybe a week from now or maybe sooner. Uh, everybody, be blessed. Thank you, Tracy. Yeah, political coffee with Robin okay. McCoy and Tracy, Attorney Tracy Martin. Everybody, stay safe. Okay. All right. Cheers. Cheers. Stay safe, everybody. See you next time. All right. Okay. Bye, okay. Robin. Bye, Tracy. See you later. Everybody be safe and be Bye. blessed. Okay.